as with so many other issues. The Buddha took that middle road when it came to the issue of other power and self-power in the path. On the one hand, there's that famous passage where Ananda comes to see him. He says that having admirable friends is half the practice, half of the holy life. And Buddha says, don't say that. Having admirable friends is the whole of the holy life. And the Buddha gives himself as an example. He says, without me as your admirable friend, you wouldn't be practicing the full noble path. Notice that. He doesn't say, I'm doing it for you. He says, I'm an outside condition. It makes it possible for you to practice. If we didn't have the Buddha, we didn't have the Dharma to point the way to us, where would we be right now? We wouldn't be right here, that's for sure. We'd be off someplace else, doing who knows what. At the same time, there's also that passage where the Buddha says, it's up to you to follow the path. The Tanatakas only point the way. Or the passage where someone comes to see the Buddha and says, why is it when you teach the path to people, they don't all arrive at the goal? Implying that there's something wrong with the Buddha as a teacher. Buddha says, well, in the same way, have you ever given directions to people to follow a road from one city to another? And the man said, yes. He said, do all, they all get to that other city? He says, well, some people follow the directions and others don't. That's something I can't take responsibility for. And the Buddha said in the same way. He can't take responsibility for the fact that some people achieve the noble attainments after following his instructions and some people don't. In other words, it's up to each of us to actually put the teachings into practice so we can get the results. The Dharma that we're trying to attain is something that's going to be inside the heart. The Dharma we hear is pointing to that Dharma. But we're talking about Dharma Desana, pointing to the Dharma. Then. The word for Dharma talk literally means pointing to the Dharma. These words are not the Dharma. The words point to what's a possible attainment inside your heart, what the potentials are inside your heart. It's up to you to develop them. The problem, of course, is that there are many yous in there, lots of different opinions. Lots of different intentions, lots of different goals. And the mind moves from one to another. And when the time comes to sit down and meditate, part of the mind is with the program and part of the mind is not. Which can be the cause for a lot of frustration. But we want to learn how to use these many cells to our advantage. Remember, each self that you have is the result of an activity. As some people say, it's we self as a verb. We're engaged in selfing. If we had one set self, we'd be stuck there. That would be our nature and we wouldn't be able to change it. Any changes would have to come from outside. But fortunately, we're not stuck with one self. We have lots of different selves, and there are lots of different activities trying to find happiness. And it can help one another along. They can provide a perspective on one another. So that one, one self doesn't see, another self can see. But one self can't do, another self can't.
And it's important that we learn to get all of these different selves working together. This is why the Buddha focused so much attention on the, the issue of happiness. Because all our activities, all our selves, are aimed at happiness, one form or another. We have different understandings of what it might be, different strategies for how to get there. But that's what they're aimed at. So we have to learn how to get them to work together, to understand where true happiness might lie, where it could be found. And you're going to encounter this a lot as you meditate. You're sitting here with a breath and suddenly there's an impulse to go someplace else. You have to examine that impulse, learn how to say no, and learn how to make it stick. Sometimes you can do that simply by noticing, oh, here comes an impulse that's going off in the wrong direction. And it drops away. You're back with a breath, no problem. Other times it goes deeper than that. It's based on a really deep misunderstanding about where happiness can be found. In cases like that, you have to reason with the mind. You've got an old habit that may have worked in some circumstances in the past. But it's not appropriate right now. This is why concentration requires some discernment. As the Buddha once said, there is no jhana without discernment. This is what he meant. To get the mind to settle down, you have to be able to reason with it, with the obstreperous parts that want to go off someplace else. Think about other things, plan other things. You have to reason with yourself to see that this doesn't really lead to any true happiness, and you're better off coming back. And as you fight off these different distractions, you find that you go deeper and deeper into a lot of the mind's misunderstandings. This concentration gives rise to insight. Or as the Buddha said, there is no discernment without jhana. The two go together. The two depend on each other. So we get good instructions, hear the Dhamma, see the Dhamma practiced in a way that is an inspiring example. That's the kind of help we get from outside. As for inside, we have to develop the conviction that we can do it and it's really worth doing it. This is where the Buddha's definition of acceptance comes in. Oftentimes we hear that part of practice is radical acceptance when you learn how to accept who you are, just as you are, and it's all okay. But that's making a lot of assumptions right there, that there is a who you are, that you are a certain way and you're going to stay that certain way, and it's all right to stay that certain way. which totally goes against what the Buddha had to teach. To begin with, he didn't say that you are a certain way or that you're stuck there. The question of who you are is something he put aside. As you focus instead on what you do, and what are you doing? Is it skillful or is it not? If it's not skillful, one, you've got to admit the fact that it's not skillful, and two, accept the fact that you could make your behavior more skillful. This is a part of acceptance that a lot of us resist. We may not be happy where we are, but for some reason we resist changing. This is the way I am. This is the way I'm going to stay. That kind of acceptance the Buddha does not encourage at all. Or, this is the way I do things, I'm going to keep on doing them this way. That's clinging, that's a cause of suffering.
what he wants us to accept is the fact that we are causing suffering, but we don't have to. We do have the potential to change. And that's something many of us resist. Even though we know we're suffering, for some reason we don't want to change. We disempower ourselves. So the first step in regaining some of that power is to have the conviction. And yes, the Buddha did gain awakening through his own efforts. And he did it through qualities of mind, developing qualities of mind that we have in a potential form and that we can develop too. That conviction is meant to be a challenge. Are you going to live your life without examining these possibilities, without trying to develop these qualities? If so, you're missing out on something really important. That's what acceptance is. You accept the challenge. And you look at the alternative. Continued suffering. Another teaching that might be taken is the Buddha's teachings on acceptance. Number five. Things that he has us reflect on day in and day out. From subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation from all that is dear and appealing to me. That's accepting the, the fact of suffering in its various forms. That's not just you, not just me, it's everybody subject to these things. And then the fifth thing he has us accept is that we're the owners of our actions, heir to our actions, born of our actions, related through our actions, have our actions as our arbitrators. Whatever we do for good or for evil, to that we will we fall heir. In other words, what we're experiencing in the present is the result of our actions, past and present, and what we'll experience in the future is the result of our actions. So it's up to us what we're going to experience. In other words, we have to accept responsibility. There is suffering, we're responsible for the suffering that has happened, but we also have the potential not to suffer. That's another part of conviction, another part of the type of acceptance the Buddha has us practice. Not just accepting where we are, but accepting that we have the responsibility for where we are, and we have the responsibility, we have the power to change. Again, some of us resist that. But where does that resistance take us? It keeps us stuck in suffering. So when you develop conviction that awakening is possible, and it can be developed, can be found through developing qualities you have in potential form. That leads to the next strength, the next power, which is persistence, energy, the effort that we put into the practice. And if we realize that we can do it, we better get to it and stick with it. So we practice when we feel like practicing, we also practice when we don't feel like practicing. We can't let our moods be in charge. We have to realize that this is a path that if we don't follow it now, who knows when we're going to be able to follow it. Nobody else can do it for us. Other people can point out the way, other people can inspire us with their example. But if we're going to see the results, we have to do the action. We have to train the mind train our intentions. So we have to stick with it. This leads to the third strength, or the third power, which is mindfulness, the ability to keep these facts in mind. That regardless of what you want to do, this is the way things are. You don't work at the practice now, you may not have the time you know, on into the future, so you've got to keep working at it now, keep at it now, keep at it now. Unfortunately, it's not all work, not all 
strenuous effort. Because if you're mindful and alert, as you try to develop skillful qualities and let go of unskillful ones, the mind comes to concentration. And concentration is characterized by pleasure, rapture, equanimity, a strong sense of well-being. This is what gives us energy on the path. When the Buddha talks about the different factors of the path, concentration he gets compared to food in many different ways. He says we feed on rapture, like the radiant gods. Or when he compares our practice to being in a frontier fortress, right concentration is the different kinds of foods that keep you strong, well nourished. That becomes a form of strength that you can develop inside. And then there's discernment, the ability to see clearly where suffering is arising and what's arising with it. In other words, what are you doing when you notice that there's suffering in the mind? When the suffering goes, what did you just do? What did you just change? You can see suffering arising and passing away. You can see its causes arising and passing away, so you understand. And it's this understanding that allows you to cut through the causes with more and more precision, which of course makes the mind lighter and lighter. So these are strengths that we can develop within. This is the kind of inner power that we can develop once we know the path and are convinced that it can be done. And so it's important that we accept that we have these potentials. that whatever way we are, whatever way we behave, it can be changed. As the Buddha once said, if, if it were not possible to abandon unskillful actions and to develop skillful ones, he wouldn't say to develop the skillful ones. But it is possible. This is why he has you focus on the issue of action, what you can do as opposed to what you are, or what habits you've had in the past. Habits can be changed. And if you find yourself resisting that fact, you have to ask yourself, why? What do you get out of it? What do you gain? Is it from laziness? Is it from pride? Well, why do we engage in laziness and why do we engage in pride? Well, we think they make us feel good. But do they really make us happy? Do they really lead us to well-being? You have to see that every action we make, every choice we make, is made for the purpose of happiness. But a lot of times it's misplaced, ill-advised. So whatever the intention was that goes against the path, you can reason with it until you win it over. That's the kind of internal work we all have to do. Accept that we have these potentials, and accept the fact that if we don't develop them, we're going to keep on suffering. So when we talk about acceptance in the Buddhist teachings, it's not simply accepting what you are. What you are is a big question mark. The Buddha has you accept where you are, i.e., you're stuck in suffering. But you don't have to be stuck there. That's the other thing you have to accept. You have the potential through training your actions, training your intentions, training the mind, to go beyond suffering. We have the Buddha and his noble disciples as our examples. We have the Dharma as our guide. That's the outside help, the outside power. The inside power is something we can generate from within. 
as we follow their example. As we bring our actions in line with a guide provided by the Dharma. This is a teaching that's stressed over and over again in the forest traditions. You don't change the Dharma to suit yourself, you change yourself to fit with the Dharma. Like you change your actions to fall in line with the Dharma. And that's how you develop your inner power that can lead to true happiness, the, tra the happiness we all want. Part of us may resist, but you learn how to reason with those parts, reason with those attitudes. When you do, you find that everything converges. All the factors of the path come together. It doesn't really matter whether it was because of outside help or because of inside help, your inner strength. The fact is that you've reached release and that's all that matters. So accept that that's a possibility and see where it takes you.